Krishna, Jai Prabhupada. Jai Prabhupada. <coughs> Jai my obeisances, all glories to Srila Prabhupada. So, Hare Krishna, welcome everyone to the program today. You know, because uh, coming up in a few days, we have a very special occasion. Uh, it it's on, falls on the 5th, I think, and on Wednesday. It's called Nishringa Chaturdesi. Meaning, it's a, the day in which one of Lord Vishnu's avatars appears in this world. And the avatar is called Narasimha Dev. Narasimha. Just, just like my name, you know. My name is, I have a name Bhakti Vignavinasha Narasimha. So it's a name after Lord Narasimha Dev. Lord Narasimha Dev. Meaning, the half line and half man. The Lord, Lord Vishnu has many avatars. Some of you may be familiar, or you may not. Anyway, uh, there's a, there's a, there's a well-known song by a great saint called Jayadev Goswami called Gita Govinda. And in the Gita Govinda, he begins the Gita Govinda by glorifying Ten of the prominent avatars of Lord Vishnu, uh, beginning for it begins with uh, Matsya, the fish avatar, and then there's Kurma, the turtle avatar, and then there's uh, Nishringa, Kurma, Varaha, the boar avatar, and then Narasimha. So he's the fourth of the ten of these prominent avatars. Actually, there's many, many avatars of Vishnu. But uh, ten of them are particularly glorified by Jayadev Goswami in that famous Gita Govinda song. So, within our institution, the, the, the Hare Krishna movement, or the International Society for Krishna Consciousness, we were taught also to worship Lord Narasimha Dev. And when we visit places like uh, India, uh, Nepal, uh, South India especially, we see also temples there also there that occasionally we also find they worship also Lord Narasimha Dev, Lord Narasimha Avatar, along with others. But Lord Narasimha it's very has a very special significance, the worship of Lord Nishingadev, because he appears to protect the devotees. And I'm I'm going to tell you the story. I have a PowerPoint presentation to show you some pictures. I hope you'll enjoy the 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 pictures. Uh, you know, we say a, a, one picture is worth a thousand words. <laughs> so. Uh, We've got, uh, we'll, we'll use some pictures to illustrate, to, just to illustrate the pastime of the appearance of Lord Narasimha. So like I said, this Wednesday, we'll be celebrating the appearance day of Lord Narasimha Dev. Here in Mayapur, where I'm staying at this time, due to the lockdown, I don't usually spend so much time in Mayapur, but this time, due to the current situation in the world, it's very convenient to be here in Mayapur. And we do also worship Lord Narasimha Dev here. And we have a very wonderful deity of Lord Narasimha Dev here in Mayapur. If any of you have the opportunity to come to Mayapur, you may have seen that deity of Lord Narasimha Dev. So that deity was installed after Srila Prabhupada had departed from the world. And the reason why it was installed was to help to protect the devotees, because there was some danger. Actually, uh, the, the temple had been attacked by some dacoits. They had come with the intention of stealing the, the deities from the temple, because they thought the deities were made of gold. And when they came, they threw bombs, and one of the devotees, he lost a leg during that attack. 
so you know because our temple here in Mayapur it's a little remote especially in the pioneering days in the 1970s when Srila Prabhupada was present it was very much remote here it's on the other side of the, of the city of Navadvi which is about four hours away from Calcutta so it, it's you know farmland Muslim farmers, mostly Muslim farmers here. But we have our world headquarters for our society here. So we, we need to protect the devotees. And they thought it would be very appropriate to bring the deity of Lord Nisringadev here. So, uh, I think most of you may be familiar with this. I, let me just put, put it onto screen share and we'll begin this uh, PowerPoint. Are you all able to see everything okay? Yes. You're okay? Okay, so here's some, this is Srila Prabhupada telling this story. We have it, we have transcribed here along, you can see on the right, the picture of Lord Narsimhadev and you see the small boy there offering some uh, garland to Lord Narsimhadev and at the same time Lord Narsimhadev is He's got some man's body, some unfortunate man's body on his lap and he's ripped his body apart. So we will explain what happened. Just let me go back here. So here Srila Prabhupada was describing in one class. He says, so today, appearance day of Lord Nishringadev. Lord Nishringadev appeared on this Narsimha Chatodasi on account of his devotee. Prahlad. The, the small boy is Prahlad. As it is stated in Bhagavad Gita, Yada Yadahi Dharmashya Glanir Bhavati Bharata Adbhutanama Dharmashya. From Bhagavad Gita, fourth chapter, Lord Krishna is describing why he appears. So Prabhupada quotes, first of all, the seventh verse, and then he goes on to the eighth verse. Paritranaya sadunam vinaschaya chaduskritam sambhavami yuge yuge, Prabhupada says, right? So the Lord Krishna is describing his mission and appearing in the world in order to re-establish dharma and to give pleasure to the devotees and to destroy the demons who are against his mission. So the Lord behaves like that. Uh, let's see what Prabhupada goes on. Oh, he says, the Lord appears with two purposes. Paritranaya sadunam. Just to give protection and rescue the devotees and to kill the demons. Vinashchaya chaduskritam. So Prahlad Maharaj, five-year-old boy, his only fault was he was Krishna conscious. He was devotee of Krishna. <laughs> you can see the, in the picture, this is Prahlad Maharaj. On, just like on our altar in Mayapur, we have also, we have Lord Nishringadev, we also have Prahlad Maharaj there. So Prabhupada goes on, that was his only fault. Remember the fault? That he was a devotee of Krishna. And the father was so unkind to the child. Even five years old, he could not excuse. Oh, let this boy do whatever, chanting Hare Krishna. No, the demons are so much against God consciousness, that even at his home he would not allow his own to become God conscious. This is 
demoniac civilization. Prabhupada continues, So you'll find many critics, many enemies, because you are making progress in Krishna consciousness. So the demons are always against Krishna consciousness movement. That is the whole history. Just like Lord Jesus Christ, he was crucified. What was his fault? He was preaching God consciousness. That's all. This society is so cruel. So Prahlad Maharaj was tortured in so many ways. The torturing method, I think you will find, as you will see in today's picture, how Prahlad Maharaj was tortured. Right? We, you can see here, if, going back to this picture, you see Prahlad sitting there with the other boys. And Prahlad was talking to them. He was talking to them about making proper use of their life. Prahlad Maharaj was saying, why should we spend our, our time just playing football and running after a ball and throwing balls to each other? We will waste many years in this way. Prahlad Maharaj said, we have to spend many years growing up and in the same way in old age we will spend many years helpless, incapacitated. And then we spend also so much of our time sleeping. Every day if we sleep 12 hours a day, then out of one year we've slept six months. Of course you may say, well I don't sleep 12 hours. Okay, then we sleep what? Six to eight hours. So that it's the same, three, four, four and a half months. Like that we spend a lot of time engaging in these different activities. What is the value of life? Prahlad Maharaj was speaking to his friends. He was encouraging them to understand the importance of human life and how to make the good use of it. So Prahlad Maharaj he was encouraging his friends to chant Hare Krishna. And his father did not like this because his father was a great enemy of Lord Vishnu. He hated the name Vishnu. He wanted to become himself the Supreme Lord. So this is the story of uh, the appearance of Lord Nishringadev. It's described actually the boy's father, Prahlad's father, his name was Haranya Kashipu. Haranya means gold and Kashipu means soft bed. So his father was a great materialist and he was very attached to sense gratification and having money and power and he did great austerities to get the power. He worshipped Lord Brahma and he got the benediction from Brahma. So Brahma, when Brahma asked him, what benediction do you want, he said, I don't want to die. Well, Lord Brahma said, well, I can't give you that benediction because I also have to die. So then Hiranyakashipu, thinking himself to be very intelligent, he said, then grant me the blessing that I will not be killed by any animal or any man or any god or any being. So, Lord Brahma said, all right. And then he, he said, and grant me the blessing, I should not be killed in the daytime or in the nighttime. And Lord Brahma said, all right. And then he said, I want the blessing that I should not die on the land or in the water or in the air. So Lord Brahma said, all right. And in this way, Haranyakashipu thought he was getting the, a blessing by which he would never die. So this is the materialist's idea. They want to avoid death 
they're very afraid of death and they would take great efforts to try to avoid dying. They do not understand the nature of the material body. Prahlad Maharaj, however, is a saintly devotee. So his father was very worried because his son was trying to preach Krishna consciousness and he was teaching all of his friends. So his father decided he would have to have his son killed. So you can see in the, in the picture how these different demons are coming, trying to kill him. And there's snakes, poison snakes there also. The snakes would bite him, but nothing would happen. The demons would try to pierce his body with their spear, but their spears would bend. It would become like rubber. They would have no effect on the body of Prahlad. So, anyway, his father tried many ways. Here's another way. They threw him off a mountain. But the Mother Bhumi, she's very dear to the Lord. She saves him. Sometimes they threw, threw him in the sea. And the sea would wash him back ashore. No matter what happened, they couldn't harm Prahlad because Prahlad was not an ordinary person. He was actually a great devotee. And he was, because he's a great devotee, he's very dear to the Lord. Right? So one day, Prabhupada continues, one day Haranyakashipu, after all, Prahlad was his son. So affection was there, father and son. So one day Haranyakashipu asked the boy. So he asked his son, My dear son, what have you learned? What is the best thing you have learned from your teachers? Kindly let me know. So Prahlad Maharaj told his father, I have learned like this. What is that? And this is how Prahlad answered, you see. It's a very wonderful verse which appears in the Srimad Bhagavatam. Srinvatam Svakata Srinvatam Shravanam Kirtanam Vishnu Smaranam Padasevanam Archanam Vandam Dashyam Sakyam Atmani Vedanam Iti Pumsarpita Vishnu Bhaktis Channavalakshana Kriyate Bhagavati Adha Tanmanye Ditam Uttamam. Prahlad Maharaj is telling his father what he has learned, what is the best thing he learned. You have to understand that, you see, Prahlad Maharaj, while he was within the womb of his mother, his mother was taken to the ashram of Narada Muni. So while his, while his mother was in the ashram of Narada Muni, Narada Muni would read the scriptures to the lady. And the child in the womb could also hear. So Prahlad, although he, was, he had not taken his birth, he was in his mother's womb, but he could hear. And he heard Narada Muni tell him everything about the process of worshipping the Lord. So it's described here, Archanam Vandam Dashyam, to be always in service of the Lord, Dashyam, Sakyam, to make friendship with Him, to consider Krishna as your friend. He says, even if I do not say that He's my friend, He says, I am friend of everyone. Suri Dham Sarva Bhutanam. Yeah, Krishna, the Lord, He's a friend of everyone, not only the devotee, he's a friend, the best friend of everyone. We don't want his friendship, but we want, but he wants our friendship. <laughs> he wants us to go back to home, Godhead, we don't want. So he is more anxious to take us, exactly like the Father is more affectionate than the son. That's a fact. Often happens like that. You have a son. The son is not so affectionate, but the father cares. My son. 
So the same way, Lord Narasimha Dev is Lord Vishnu and he is the father of everyone. So he is very affectionate to his son, particularly a son like Prahlad, who is such a wonderful devotee. So you can see, because Prahlad was put through so many difficulties, the father trying to kill him, at a certain point, Hiranyakashipu confronted his son and he asked his son, where is this person Vishnu? Where is he? And Prahlad told his father, he said, he is everywhere, father. He's everywhere. Because Prahlad Maharaj is the topmost devotee. So he sees the Lord everywhere. There are different levels of devotees. So Prahlad is like Uttama Bhakta, the highest devotee. The highest devotees, they see God everywhere, in everything. We are in everything in God, in God in everything. So when his father asked him, where is this God? Prahlad said, he's, he's everywhere, Father. So then his father asked, is he in this pillar? There was some pillar there in the building and Prahlad said, yes, Father, he's there. So Haranyakashipu then began to strike the pillar and from the pillar, this form, you can see this form, half lion, half man, with four arms, appears from the pillar. This is the form of Lord Narsimhadev. And Haranyakashipu, then he begins to fight with Lord Narsimhadev. And there's a great battle takes place. <laughs> right? So Lord Narsimhadev was greatly angered because Prahlad, the child, is a devotee. And the Lord does not like to see his devotee put through difficulties. But this demon, Haranyakashipu, had given so much trouble trying to kill his own son. So Lord Nishringadev was very angry. And he appeared in the angry mood and he had a great battle. Haranyakashipu was very powerful. And Lord Nishringadev could have a nice fight with him. But ultimately, Lord Nishringadev was victorious. And he had, to, he had to fight with this Haranyakashipu and at the same time keep intact all the benedictions which Lord Brahma had given. For example, Lord Brahma had given the benediction that he would not die in the daytime or in the night. So he died at the junction of the day and the night, just at dusk. Lord Nishringadeva appears just at dusk, just as the day changes into the night. And he did not die on the land or on the water or in the air. He died on the lap of Lord Nishringadeva. And he was not killed by any man or animal or, or God. He was killed by the Supreme Lord himself not by any weapon, but by the nails of the Lord. And so in this way, Lord Nishringadev kept all the benedictions which Lord Brahma had given, and he killed this uh, Haranyakashipu, and very nicely described in the seventh canto, in the seventh canto of the Srimad Bhagavatam, Practical and almost the whole canto is describing the appearance of Lord Nishringadev and then the prayers, the wonderful prayers which are offered by his devotee Prahlad. After Haranyakashipu has been killed, then Lord Nishringadev is in a very angry mood. And the different devas all come to try to offer their prayers to pacify Lord Nishringadev. For example, Ganesh, Ganapati, is a great devotee of Lord Nishringadev. You know, people often like to put Lord Ganesh's picture on the doorway to protect their home. But the Vaishnavas, they will put Lord Nishringadev's picture there because they know that Lord Ganesh, he gets his power from Lord Nishringadev. 
So look, Ganapati came and he tried to offer prayers, but he did, he did not have any effect. Lord Nasringadev was so angry. Then they brought Lord Nasringadev's wife, Lakshmi, the goddess of fortune, because Lord Nasringadev is Vishnu. So Vishnu's consort is Lakshmi, and Lakshmi is also the wife of Lord Nasringadev. So they brought her, put her forward, but Lord Nasringadev didn't even notice her. He just kept on roaring and raging. He was so upset. His anger had been aroused so much by the mistreatment of his devotee, Prahlad. And then finally, after many demigods had all tried, it was Prahlad Maharaj who came forward. And when Lord Nasringadev saw his little devotee, this little boy, come forward before him, then Lord Nasringadev was pacified. And he took Prahlad up on his lap and he sat him on his lap. And he also took his conch shell and touched his head. And in this way, Prahlad Maharaj, although he's only a young child, he could offer wonderful prayers to Lord Nasringadev. So here you can see some of the different illustrations of this pastime. Lord Nasringadev, sometimes you can see he's very angry and other times he appears almost blissful, joyful. Hmm? Here you can see <laughs> very angry. When Harani Kashipu came to attack Lord Nasringadev, so many other followers of Harani Kashipu, they also came to attack Lord Nasringadev. And Lord Nasringadev had to deal with all of them. So his anger was greatly aroused. You can see in this illustration how angry he was dealing with all these different soldiers who came to attack him. So, uh, we say, Bhakta Vigna Vinasha Narasimha Bhagavan. Lord Nasringadev is the Supreme Lord Bhagavan and he can destroy the Vigna. Vigna means the obstacles and Vinasha, knocked apart, destroyed. So Lord Nasringadev removes all the obstacles on the path of devotion. So we offer our worship to Lord Nasringadev on this particular uh, day when he appears, which this year is coming on, I think it's the 5th of the month, on Wednesday. And the, traditionally, we will do a special worship of the Lord Nasringadev deity. We will perform the Abhishek of the deity. Just like on the, on the birth of a child, then you will do the Abhishek, you bathe the child. So similarly, on the appearance of the Lord, we bathe also his deity. And we anoint the body of the deity with different fragrant oils. So we always have the special oil from Mayapur, Nashima oil, which is offered on this particular day. Here you can see Lord Nasringadev. You notice the four symbols of Vishnu. The four symbols of Vishnu there, the club and the conch and the Sudarshan chakra and the lotus flower. So these are the four symbols of Lord Vishnu. And here at the side you see Prahlad Maharaj and also Lakshmi, the goddess of fortune. Again, Lord Nasringadev with his consort Lakshmi and Prahlad Maharaj praying by his side. Here you can see other different demigods, different devas, different assistants of Lord Nasringadev, along with Prahlad and Lakshmi. So, the worship of Lord Nasringadev is very popular within our Hare Krishna movement. Srila Prabhupada actually gave us Srila Prabhupada introduced the worship of Lord Nasringadev to us. Uh, he told us to, just simply to sing the song. We sing the particular stotram from the uh, Dasavatar stotra 
which is written by Jayadeva Goswami. Tavakara Kamala Varena Kamad Bhutta Shringam Dalita Hiranya Kashipu Tano Bringam Keshavadrita Narahare Rupa Jai Jagadisha Hare Jai Jagadisha Hare Jai Jagadisha Hare So Jayadeva describes Lord Nishringadeva's appearance that the Lord appears to kill this demon Harani Kashipu, uh, who is uh, he's coming to protect his devotee Prahlad Maharaj. Because it's a pastime of the Lord. Prabhupada quoted in his talk at the beginning, we showed you from Bhagavad Gita, the Lord's mission is not just simply to destroy the demons, but he also comes to give pleasure to the devotees. So Prahlad Maharaj, although he had the experience of seeing his own father killed by Lord Nishringadev, it, it didn't disturb his devotion for Lord Nishringadev. <laughs> That's a bit of a challenge, isn't it? If you see someone kill your father, you think, oh no, he's going to kill, he kills my father, you hate him. But Prahlad Maharaj understood, first of all, that his father is not the body, but he's a soul, and the soul never dies. So Lord Nishringadev came and he simply removed him from that body. Actually, the, the scriptures tell us about the appearance of this, this father of Prahlad Maharaj, that he, he was actually sent from the the Vaikuntha, because he was one of the gatekeepers in Vaikuntha. When you go to the temples, you will often see at the gate of the temple, there are two persons. One is called Jai and the other is called Vijay. So they're like the guardians of the temple. So in the Vaikuntha also, at the gateway to Vaikuntha, there are two attendants, Jai and Vijay. So it happened that on one occasion the four Kumaras, the first sons of Lord Brahma, were entering into Vaikuntha and they got stopped by these two gatekeepers, Jai and Vijay. So when they were stopped, then the four Kumaras were upset and they challenged that we don't think you're actually fit to be residents here in the spiritual world. So the four Kumaras, they cursed these two gatekeepers that they should go down to the material world. And it was actually the plan of the Lord. The Lord actually desired that these two gatekeepers would go to the material world and he allowed them to take birth as demons because that way they would come back quicker. And at the same time, when they take birth as demons, then the Lord can also go there and fight with them. Because Lord Vishnu likes to have a battle. He likes to fight with people sometimes. He likes fighting. He likes to have a good combat. But he doesn't get people willing to fight him in Vaikuntha. So he has to send some of his devotees from the Vaikuntha into the material world. And he sends them like that, as to become demons, and he goes there to fight with them. And this is a pleasure for the Lord, that he can have a good battle with them. So many purposes were served by this pastime of the appearance of Lord Nishringadev. Hmm. So I, maybe you would like to ask something or point out something, maybe I didn't include something. For those of you who are there listening, would you like to comment more? You're all familiar with Lord Nishringadev? Not at all. Not at all. Oh, really? Oh. 
Okay. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Hare um, Krishna. I just wanted to mention that um, I really like this story of um, Prahlad and uh, his father Hirna Kashipu along with Narasimha Dev because it talks about uh, how our ego is destroyed and where our ego can take us if we do not keep it under control. And today knowing this was very nice. Okay, thank you. Yes, the false ego, the ahankar, it's always very strong in those who are of the demoniac nature. In the Bhagavad Gita, Lord Krishna describes two natures. If you look at chapter 16, Lord Krishna describes that there are two kinds of natures. One is called divine and the other is called demoniac. Or they say Daivi Sampad and Asurik Sampad. So what is the difference between the two? What makes the difference between these two kinds of people? The difference is that those who have the, the, the divine nature, the Daivi Sampad, they will be obedient to the instructions of the scriptures. They follow the teachings of the scriptures. They're obedient to the orders of the Lord. Just like in Bhagavad Gita, Lord Krishna is giving instructions. So those of, who are the the godly nature, meaning more in the mode of goodness. They will be obedient to the will of the Lord and the, His teachings and His instructions. Whereas those who are more in the mode of rajas and tamas and who are more asuri sampad, more of the demonic nature, they don't care at all for the teachings of the scriptures. They just want to do whatever they feel like doing. They think, well, who's to tell me that I'm wrong? Let me do, I'm going to do what I feel like doing. They, they, they will say, if it feels good, do it, you know. So, some people are, are of that mentality. So that kind of mentality is only going to lead to problems, you're going to get troubles. Uh, we have to be very conscious and careful of how we live and how we act in this world. So, we all have ego and we cannot destroy ego. Ego is going to be there. We have to understand what is the proper ego. What should be the proper ego? The, the ahankar, the false ego, we're thinking, I am the body. We're thinking, I am the controller, I am the doer, right? But the, the pure ego is to think that I am the servant of the Supreme Lord, Krishna. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu taught, Jivar Swarupahaya Nitya Krishna Das. That eternally we're all the servants of the Supreme Lord Krishna. So Prahlad, the devotee Prahlad boy in the story, he understood this position because he'd heard, he'd been hearing the scriptures, although he was still within the womb of his mother, but he'd been hearing from Narada Muni. Narada Muni had brought the wife of Haranyakashipu to his ashram and he read the scriptures regularly to, to the lady and she was hearing but she was not taking it very seriously but the child in the womb, he took it very seriously and after his birth he could remember all that he had heard and then he began to teach it to, to other people and this greatly enraged the father. This was a problem. So, ego is going to be there. We have to know how to keep, how to purify, put the ego in its proper place. We cannot just simply remove ego. We have to have some ego, but the ego must be properly directed. And the proper direction for the ego is, a, is towards the lotus feet of Krishna, to take shelter of the lotus feet of the Lord and become a humble servant. That's very important. Then, if we, by taking shelter, 
of the lotus feet of the Lord, then no more birth and death. That's the, the value. The Lord will take us out from this world. Thank you, Prabhu, for putting ego into perspective. Hare Krishna. Hare yeah. Krishna. Anybody else like to make a comment or have any question? Uh, Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna, Prabhu. Uh, Mataji had a question. Uh, I, uh, Guru Maharaj, I had a general question, not about this topic. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's about uh, this thing it comes every now and then to me. Uh, uh, the concept of the soul or the Atman, right? Yeah. So are they, how are they created or if they are omnipresent, then uh, what are the states in which they live? For example, when there was no life, where did they reside and how, how where is the start and the end? Because mm. you always think of even rebirth, mm. and you, then the next stage is how the soul uh, in itself was. Uh, yes, okay. Uh, yeah. All right. Even, uh, yeah, because I'm very confused about that. Okay, so from, from Bhagavad Gita, we learn that for the soul, there's no birth and there's no death. So the soul is eternal. So you say, then where does it come from? Right? Well, you have to understand that we're living now in the material world, which is the place of birth and death. But there's a whole other world away from, well, on the other side of this world, we have what is called the spiritual world, or Vaikuntha Dham, or Goloka. You see these places, Vaikuntha, Goloka, they're in the, what we call the spiritual sky. And Lord Krishna also speaks about this in the Bhagavad Gita. Hmm. So, from the Bhagavad Gita, we learn how our soul is entangled in the material energy, and we take birth and die. In different bodies, many, we've taken many births. For, and we've been in this material world for a long time. We've had many different bodies. So we tend to identify with the body, but actually we're souls living in the body. So we want to make use of this body to free ourselves from the wheel of birth and death. Coming into this material world means you take a material body. We take birth in a material body, means we're going to die one day too, right? Nobody can say, I'm not going to die. That was the mistake of the, the demon in the story today. You know, he, want, he thought, I don't want to die. He, he worshipped Brahma and he got benedictions, but still he had to die. One who takes birth has to die. But the soul never takes birth. So for the soul there's no death. And so we have to understand first of all the nature of this body. That this body is only the, the dress or the vehicle. Now if you get a new car, are you going to be happy? If you get a new, a new car, wouldn't it be nice? Yeah? You get a new car, you oh, wow, great, go for a ride, you know, enjoy it. So the body is also like a car. So this body gets old one day, we have to give it up, we get a new body, nothing to lament. But, of course, you want to be careful what kind of body you get. Because from the Vedas, we learn there are 8,400,000 different species of life. Now we have the human form, but we don't, we're not guaranteed always to have a human form. The human form is like the jun junction in, this, in, in life. It's where we earn our karma, which will determine what kind of body we take in the future. Whether we go up 
or whether we go down or come back. There are higher planets, heavenly planets, and there are hellish planets, lower planets. There's higher species of life like Devas, and Gandharvas, and Siddhas, and there are lower species of life, animals, trees. These things, they also have souls. You know, so what kind of body, the, the body we take in the future will depend on how we use this, the body in this life. We have to understand how to make the best use from this body. So it begins by inquiry, just as you're doing, you're asking, you want to understand about the soul. Yeah, we have to understand the soul. And we should understand the soul is not material, it's spiritual. And the spiritual nature means eternal, full of bliss and knowledge. But the body, which includes also our mind, is temporary and also subject to illusion and ignorance. So we have to try to change our consciousness. This pra what we're doing is we practice the yoga called bhakti yoga, yoga of devotion. We practice devotion for the Supreme Lord, Vishnu, Krishna, by worshipping. Because we understand the soul is a part of Vishnu. It's not Vishnu, but it's a tiny part of him. And we have a relationship with him. Just like in the body, the hand is connected to the body. The hand is a part of the body. But when the hand is disconnected from the body, it's useless. We want to keep the hand connected to the body. The same way our soul should be connected to the Supreme Soul. This is yoga. Yoga meaning to link, to connect, to come together with the Supreme. And we do this through the chanting of the names of the Lord. Just like we chant the Hare Krishna mantra. And we also worship like Lord Nishringadev. We also worship Lord Krishna. Like so by doing these acts of devotion, we cultivate our devotion. We connect our soul to the Supreme Soul. And this way our consciousness becomes more connected to the Supreme. This is important because when we give up this body, the consciousness which we have at the end of life will determine the type of body we're going to take in the next life. From the Bhagavad Gita, Lord Krishna describes, whatever we remember at the end of life, that will determine the body we take in the next life. So we want to try to develop this consciousness of Krishna or Vishnu, remembering Him. And then we can be qualified to go to be with Him. We can get free from the wheel of birth and death. We can go to the, the, the spiritual world. Spiritual world, you also have a body, but not a material body. You have a spiritual body. Is it a little clearer? Yes, yes. Have you read so, the... Is time, uh, is, is time a matter in the spiritual world or uh, you don't have a feeling of time? No, there's no time in the spiritual world. It's beyond the realm of time. Yes. Uh, that it makes sense. Time is here in the material world and that's why there's old age and disease and death, that's why birth and death, birth and death, they're all influenced by time, you see. But in the spiritual world, there's, there's no time. It's beyond the realm of time. So the spiritual world is a very blissful, very joyful place. And we are also told that the vast number of living entities actually reside in the spiritual world. We're in the minority here in the material world. There's far more living entities in the spiritual realm. So consciousness is 
very important and our consciousness depends on our way of living and acting, the type of food we eat, the things we do with our time, they all influence our consciousness. So, uh, one more thing, you, you mentioned that the devas are a higher entity, but um, from my childhood I've been told uh, at home that even uh, the human beings, uh, even the devas desire to be humans because that's the only path to moksha. Uh, is that true? Or yes, that, yeah, that's a good, it's true, it's a good point that sometimes the, the devas, they like to come to this planet because from the earth planet as human beings, they can go directly to the spiritual world. It's easier for them to get the moksha from here than it is from heaven. Because if you go to heaven, there's so much attraction, so much enjoyment, so much pleasure of the senses that it's very difficult to get to think of moksha because there's just so much pleasure, heavenly pleasure. You know, everyone is so good looking and so intelligent and so opulent and so nobody, you know, nobody wants to leave, you know. They think, you know, we have, and they live a long time and they don't get old. The bodies don't age like our bodies age here quickly, you know. But there, people don't age in the higher planets. So it's very enjoyable there. They don't have disease also like here where so much disease at this time especially, but that's not there in the heavenly realm. So there's a lot of enjoyment there, but it's very difficult to concentrate on leaving it, to go beyond, to go to get the moksha. So the demigods under better to come here. So they're waiting to take birth here and they 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 like to they, they will like to take their birth in the family of devotees. You see, because if they, when the devas come, they will take they will choose just like when the Lord comes, when Lord Krishna, Lord, they they incarnate into the family of very special persons, so that you know it's very easy for them to have their pastimes. So in the same way, the demigods, when they come, if they have to, if they come down here to take birth, they will take birth in a family of devotees, so that, you know, from birth they're hearing the glories of the Lord. Maybe in their home there will be a deity, and there will be the chanting, the reading of scriptures, and so on. So, this is why the demigods come to this planet. Yeah. Thank you. Nice Thank question. You uh, Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Uh, Guru Maharaj, uh, they are first time and they are my college and they are living in Bangalore. Just want to quickly introduce them to you. Oh, very nice. Welcome. Yeah. So tr give them some beads. Maybe they can also chant a little. If you can give the Jaffa beat. Sure, sure. We have attended a few uh, when we... Oh, really? When we played in Southern California, in Laguna Beach, uh, Iskandar oh, oh, yeah, yeah, Laguna yeah. Beach, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I've been there a few times. Okay. Yeah, but then I've been, yeah. yeah, yeah. The headquarters for USA is over in Los Angeles, in Culver City. But Laguna Beach, I think they have a bunch of time. Yeah, we've been at Culver City... Uh, uh, is gone as well. Oh really? Oh, very nice. <laughs> so now you're based in Switzerland? No, no, no. We are at Bangalore. Um, yeah, we moved back a few years ago. Uh, we are in Bangalore. Oh, you're in Bangalore? Are you? India. Oh, yes. okay. Yeah. Thank you. 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 Four or five, um, but difficult moving around in Bangalore, not like in <laughs> America. Yes, we visited one of them, yeah. So you're going to be staying here in India now? Yes, yes. My mother lives here, so we just moved back. Oh. Take care. Yeah, better. I think you're much better here 
in India than to live in America. There's so many dangers, so many horror, horrible things there in America. <laughs> we don't know, we are still confused. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No. No, I think you did the right thing. You come back to your roots here in India, good culture is here. You can at least feel a little, I think, more security here. America is a very dangerous place. The Wild West. <laughs> okay, so very nice to meet you. I'm here in, in Mayapur, our center in Mayapur, just now. Uh, many devotees are also here in Mayapur, but uh, because of the lockdown, we're keeping the temple kind of restricted at this time. We just only continue the puja. They do still do the worship of the deities, even though the temple is closed. The, there's a few people who take who are there responsible to do the worship of the deity. Because. You understand, that when we say deity, it's not just simply statue, but actual, the, the life is actually there in the deity. And we worship the deity as a living person. Although it appears to be a statue to ordinary material vision, the deity is actually living personality. The Lord appears there. It's like his avatar. The Lord incarnates in this world in different ways, and one of his avatars is in the form of the deity in the temple. And there are some, you may know some of the pastimes about different deities, how, for example, in Arisa there's one deity which is called Shira Kora Gopinath, the deity which stole the sweet rice. <laughs> And there's another deity of, over there in Orissa also, simply, it's called the Shakshi Gopal deity, the witness deity. He came as a witness for a, one Brahmana to support the Brahmana's words. So the Lord does these different things. Sometimes the deity will talk, the deity can walk, the deity can eat, do different things. So we worship the deity like that, not just, sometimes in Hindu temples they just simply think the deity is just some statue and they use it as like a medium to, or some object of meditation to, to achieve their liberation. But we worship the deity as a, like a living person, a life form. So on, on the, the appearance day, of Lord Nishingadev this Wednesday, we'll do the special worship of the Lord and generally what we do also, we observe fasting. Just like on Janmashtami, on Krishna's birthday, Krishna's birthday is a very big festival for us. You know, I know in India also it's a big festival. Most people, uh, they, they go to temple on Janmashtami and we have the, Krishna appears at midnight so the devotees fast the whole day until the midnight and then they break the fast after midnight. So Lord Nishringadev, his appearance is at dusk, the change between day and night. So we'll fast throughout the day and we'll take food only in the evening after the, after the night begins. And before we take the food we have to do the worship of the deity, worship him and offer flowers and do a lot of chanting, dancing, a very joyful festival, you know, festivals. We should be happy, joyful. So in this way we pass our time chanting, dancing, worshipping Krishna. Because the soul's nature is joyful. When we're not joyful, we're too much in the body concept of life. The body consciousness is not enjoyable, it's not happy. But if we're thinking of our spiritual nature, we will become joyful, we'll feel real pleasure. 
And the way to do it, the way to raise your consciousness to the spiritual, you have to chant. You have to chant loudly. Do the chanting. Very powerful. So, in your home, you know, you can also do kirtan, do the chanting. It's very nice. You don't need to go to temple. The chanting can be done anywhere. Okay. So, anybody else there? Vaishnavi? Oh, the, oh, yeah, this Prabhu, yeah, yeah, Hare Krishna Prabhu. Hare Krishna, uh, I don't know if this is really a very important question, but uh, uh, can I ask anyways? <laughs> <laughs> Why not? All right, okay, oh, thanks. Um, okay, so when we think about Narasimha and um, protecting uh, Bhakti and everything, we might also think about him protecting uh, actually a more... Uh, whole, like physical body, etc., or uh, just morality, um, is, is, does, I, I, I suppose that that is something that, that exists. And um, I also had a, like a bit of a small question on the side, the same matter. Um, if, I guess that if we surrender to Krishna, a lot of our karma goes away automatically. But is there any way that bad things could happen to us uh, for just for to teach us something, or just if like we don't have any karma and there would some bad things would happen, or is it do all the things that are bad that happen to us are they all because of uh, some reaction? <laughs> okay, yeah, yeah. People often ask about this about uh, devotee. You know, and they're, why they're suffering, they're, they're, they've taken, they've surrendered to Krishna, they shouldn't have to have any difficulties, they shouldn't have any problems. But we have to understand the nature of this world is there will be problems. We're here in this material world. Hmm. There, there will be sometimes problems, sometimes happiness and sometimes problems comes and goes. Just like winter and summer season, happiness and distress. But the devotee who is surrendered to Krishna, they will not be disturbed by the problems. They will not be excessively disturbed. Now we see, for example, the Pandavas, you know, they're, they're very great devotees surrendered to Krishna. But they suffered a lot. They had to go into exile and everything. But they never gave up. Their faith didn't weaken in Krishna. You know, they accepted all the difficulties and, and they became more devoted to Krishna. And Queen Kunti also says like that in her famous prayer. She prays to Krishna, let all the difficulties happen again and again. Because when I'm in difficulty, then I see you again and again. And by remembering you, I know there'll be no more birth and death. So a devotee understands it. it. It's not really karma though. It's the arrangement of Krishna. Krishna arranges for the devotee, for their continued progress, to help to strengthen their faith and to take away their attachments. Sometimes there may be some little bits of karma remaining, so Krishna wants to remove also that some final traces of karma. So a devotee is not so much worried, he just simply goes on. Hmm? You can read Srimad Bhagavatam, right Prabhu? You're reading Srimad Bhagavatam? Yes. Yeah? Yeah? So you've read the, the, the sixth canto, the story about the killing of Rita Sura. There's yes, a, a that was excellent where he puts on the, the armor. Yeah, uh, the, the, uh, the Narayana Kavacha shield, right? Indra. That was, I loved it, yeah. Yeah. So the demon he killed, Vritasura, you know, he, he got that body due to the curse. Lord Shiva's wife had cursed him to take that demon body. And the reason... Right, it's, it's right because he was uh, making fun of 
of him. Right, yeah, yeah. He, he criticized, he kind of, he, he kind of laughed at Lord Shiva, that, you know, <laughs> you're sitting there with your arm, your arm around your wife, and you've got all these great sages around you, worshipping you. So, uh, so Chitrakedu didn't, he, you know, he, he, he shouldn't have spoken maybe quite like that. So Lord Shiva's wife was a bit upset and she cursed him, become a demon. But in the demon body, you know, he, he, got, he had to fight with Indra and got his arms cut off and everything. But he, he didn't forget, he didn't lose his bhakti. No matter what happens, he didn't lose his bhakti. He kept his devotion for Krishna. So that's right. that's important. And by okay, well, by yeah. taking birth as a demon, the, all of his karma was used up, all removed, and he could go back to oh. Godhead. So that okay. that was the point that all the karma was removed by that birth in, in the demon body, and then he could he was free to get liberation. Right. So the difficulties, uh, not karma. He was, a, uh, he was a, a, a devotee when he when he insulted Shiva already. Was he? Yes. Oh yeah. Okay. But okay. So that means that he, 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 he still had something that that needed to be done. Yeah. He didn't really <laughs> insult Shiva. It was just you know he just thought it was funny. Yeah. He thought it was you know he thought it was a bit a bit odd. That was all. <laughs> but Shiva is so powerful that. that didn't really like it. And, uh, Lord Shiva didn't mind. Only his wife took the offense. Well, yeah, okay, okay. Lord Shiva didn't. Lord Shiva, he understood. He's a devotee. <laughs> okay. So our devotee's suffering is not ordinary. The sufferings of the devotee is just to help, to show their wonderful qualities. That even in their difficulties, they will take more shelter of Krishna. Okay. So you chanting nicely? Yes. Well, as nicely as possible. Uh, sometimes the pronunciation uh, need to need to do a re recap on the you know saying it properly, maybe a little bit. Okay. Are you going to observe Nishringa Chaturdasi? Yes, but uh, unfortunately, uh, with the uh, corona, um, it's not so so fun to be around uh, devotees so often. But actually, getting a lot more association on the on the phone than I would in real life usually. <laughs> okay, good. Yeah, that's how we're doing it. Everything's done online on the phone these days. You know, it's all online. It's all mobile. <laughs> So the, the festi oh. festival is going to be like that, you know, everybody's at a distance, no, we're not together. Maybe next time they'll get together for real instead of, like, that's what they would have probably been doing anyways. <laughs> yeah, we hope so. Okay, Prabhu. Thank you very much. Take care. Hare Krishna. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay. Hare Krishna, Michael. <laughs> anybody else there? Vaishnavi, anybody else like to ask anything or say anything? Put any questions, comments? Uh, Guru Maharaj, uh, uh, I have a question. Uh, yes. Uh, Guru Maharaj, I have heard in the classes that because we are a part and parcel of Krishna, we are getting all the quality. We also have all the qualities of Krishna like that. But I was uh, wondering, how did we get this envy and bad qualities like that? Is it in the is is there is envy is there in the spiritual world or? No, there's no envy in the spiritual world. The bad qualities come when we turn away from Krishna. Prabhupada explains that just like you have the, the front side and the back side, so the envy is the back side. The bad qualities, they're the back side. The lust, in the pure form, is love. But in the material world, because we forget Krishna, it becomes lust. 
In the so, so same way, this envy, in the spiritual world, we appreciate other people, we appreciate others, we appreciate Krishna, we worship Krishna. But in this world, because of, we, 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 because we envy Krishna, we're trying to compete with Krishna. We're, we don't want to surrender to Krishna. So it's how we, how we relate. I was explaining the divine and the demoniac, right? So divine qualities, the mode of goodness, the demoniac qualities, the mode of passion and ignorance. We fall into the modes of passion and ignorance and we take on the different qualities which come from the association with these modes. Pride, arrogance, conceit, harshness, anger, all of these things, they're demonic qualities. They come from associating with the mode of passion and ignorance. So therefore we're encouraged to come up to the mode of goodness. And then from the mode of goodness, then you can go into the spiritual world. We have to... We, we said also, what the, 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 the demonic nature comes from disobedience to the Shastra. So the more we are obedient to the Shastra, then the less these bad qualities will come. The envy is coming because we're not surrendering to the scripture. We're not accepting the authority of the great sages and the... the the different teachings which are there. So we have we have this desire to be God. You see? We want to be God ourselves. That's why we come into the material world. We want to be the supreme, we want to be the controller. So we enter into this material existence. Krishna creates this world so that we can have our little drama here in this world. We're thinking, I'm God. <laughs> when I first went to the temple, I remember when I, I visited the temple first in London, and they said, do you know who God is? I said, I'm God. You're God. We're all God. You know, they laughed at me. <laughs> they said, you're not God. How could you be God? Don't you know? Krishna's God. Krishna is this real God. He's Bhagavan. But we're all envious of him. We want to be the God. Just like Sishupal. Sishupal and Krishna Leela. Sishupal was always envious of Krishna. Hmm. So Arjuna is not envious. So because Arjuna was not envious, Krishna taught the Bhagavad Gita to him. So, yeah, we want to give up that envy. The more we cultivate the mode of goodness and become obedient to the, the, the scriptures, then the envy will also be given up. Okay? Thank you, Guru Maharaj. Uh, is there anyone else having any questions? Vijay Prabhuji, Helena? Yeah, I have one question. Uh, hello, can you hear me? Yes, yes, go ahead. <clears throat> yeah, for me the question is, while we are obedient and we follow all the uh, scriptures and uh, the advice of elders, my uh, concern there is how do we experience and understand because it's like following somebody else's truth and how do we pursue our own truth and find our own truth about the subject which is I believe is also uh, important so I would like to hear your thoughts on that. Yes, well, we find our own truth. We have to understand the truth. There, there is the absolute truth. We're not just looking for some relative truth. Relative truth means it's true today, maybe true for a little while, 
but it's not true forever. So that's not the real truth. We, we, we want to understand what is the absolute truth. And the absolute truth is found by being guided by spiritual authorities. When we're, we're looking for truth, it's not enough to just depend on our own mind. The material mind, the material intelligence are very limited and conditioned by our environment and by our upbringing and our social, ex envir social experience. All of these things, they influence our mind and consciousness. We have to transcend all of these things. We have to come to a higher consciousness, spiritual consciousness. We said the con we want to be um, awaken some consciousness of the soul. Within the body is the soul, the spiritual particle. We are actually all souls living in the body. So the, the truth is to understand, first of all, who I am and then who is the Supreme and what is my relationship, what is my connection with Him. That is the actual truth. We want to understand. This knowledge is not revealed just simply by our own mind, by our own contemplation. We have to hear. We have to hear from the spiritual authorities, the spiritual teachers who have also studied and heard this and realized it and they're also presenting it for us again. Just like Bhagavad Gita. Bhagavad Gita is eternal, perennial knowledge. It's eternal. Krishna spoke this Bhagavad Gita to the sun god millions of years ago. And the same truth is there today. It didn't change. It's not out of date. There's no faults. There's no errors in it. It's the same truth. Millions of years ago, Krishna spoke to the sun god, Vivishwan. Vivishwan gave the knowledge to Manu, the father of mankind. Then Manu gave it to Ikshvaku. And in this way, the knowledge came to the different Rajarishis, the saintly kings. But in course of time, the knowledge was lost. Therefore, 5,000 years ago, Lord Krishna had to come again and present this knowledge. This same knowledge is being presented through this Hare Krishna movement, the message of the Bhagavad Gita to establish real religion, real dharma. That is actually the nature of truth, the absolute truth. We, other conceptions of the truth will be very relative. They will change one place to another. You know, you're in one community, one society, they have one idea. You go somewhere else, they have a different idea. It's going to be it's a very relative kind of truth, not real, not actually absolute truth. We want to understand the highest truth. That is the absolute truth, the eternal truth. And that is to understand our spiritual nature and the nature of the Supreme Person behind this creation. And we can get that realization through the chanting of the names of God. In every, in every age, there's a different process. So in this Kali Yuga, the process is the chanting of the Holy Name. Therefore, we give so much importance to the chanting, Hare Krishna. We encourage people, chant the name of Krishna, read the books about Krishna, and worship Krishna. And in this way, you very quickly come to know the truth. What do you think? No, thank you, Guruji. I have further uh, questions. Maybe in the next class, I will, uh, I will reflect on this and I will come back to you with some other questions. What do you say makes 
Uh, as always, you've been very insightful and you've been giving, guiding us uh, with your wisdom. Thank you so much. And uh, in this, this is a particular topic that I've been exploring in recent times, and I, I am greatly benefiting from your uh, session. So I will come back with more questions in the subsequent sessions. Uh, okay, Prabhu. Thank you so much for your kind words. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Thank you so much, Guruji. Okay, Vaishnavi. Yes, Guru Maharaj. So, we'll finish there today, or is there any any other final thing? Vaishnavi, uh, 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 we have a one quick question. Yes, yeah, sure. So you mentioned about the shastras. So, uh, somebody who has grown up in India has a decent understanding of the Ramayana, Mahabharata, and Puranas. What's a good place to start with for the shastras? Would we be able to understand the Vedas or do we need some kind of a pre uh, thing? Yeah, and, and we don't give too much emphasis to try to study the Vedas because the Vedas, first of all, very vast and traditionally Vedas are particularly meant to be read and recited by the Brahmanas and to understand the actual purport behind the Vedas is very difficult. We give more importance to the Puranas rather than the Vedas. It will get, we get more benefit from reading the Puranas. And the cream of the Puranas is the Bhagavad Purana. So that's very readable material. It's considered to be the essence of all the Vedas. The Vedas is like a tree. And the Bhagavad Purana is like the fruit of the tree. So the fruit is a valuable part of the tree. And so if, if you can secure some copy of Srimad Bhagavatam, very good to read that. It's also certainly very helpful if you have a good basis in the Bhagavad Gita. Bhagavad Gita is real essence of Mahabharata. Mahabharata is, you know, it, it's stories, a lot of leela, different pastimes there. But the real important part of the, Bhag of the Mahabharata is Bhagavad Gita. And uh, if you study the Bhagavad Gita, then you get a good basis to go into the Puranic, into the Bhagavad Purana. So like that, uh, just reading Mahabharat, you, it's enjoyable, but you don't get the real elevation because it, it, the Mahabharat is mainly dealing with Karmakanda activities, fruitive activity, material activity. We want to go above that. So from Bhagavad Gita, Krishna describes, rise above, this, go into the higher realm. You want to transcend, to come to the spiritual platform. So Bhagavad Gita concludes with surrender. In the 18th chapter, Krishna tells Arjuna to surrender to him and give up all material religion and surrender to him. Srimad Bhagavatam goes on from that point. Now that you've surrendered, now what to do? So, this is Srimad Bhagavatam. Srimad Bhagavatam presents, it, uh, it rejects all the religions which are materially motivated. You know, material religion, it, it, we call it Kaitava Dharma, cheating religion. We go to do worship just simply to get material blessings, we want to improve our materialistic life. That's not the real purpose of hearing the Shastra. We're meant to get free of birth and death. That's the real goal. We should understand we're in the material body, we want to get free. Hmm? So maybe Vaishnavi can help you there to get some Proper reading material? Yes, Guru Maharaj. I can connect with them with the devotees and... Uh, mm. Yeah, yeah, sure. They also have a lot of nice classes online, particularly at this time. Many devotees are 
making use of the internet and presenting classes, wonderful lectures, many wonderful speakers. Your native Tamil speakers, is it? Ah, yes. So, I'm, uh, my mother tongue is Hindi, but uh, I'm brought up in uh, Tamil Nadu, so I speak Tamil better. My wife is a Tamilian, so, yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. So, yeah. Tamil speakers are certainly appreciated. We have quite a lot of Tamil devotees. So I know there's a lot of nice lectures in Tamil language. But of course, there's some very nice ones in English also. Wonderful, powerful uh, preachers who are presenting this philosophy in the Western world. Okay, so thank you very much. Anyway, very nice to meet you all today. Thank you for the association. Hare Krishna, Vaishnavi. Thank you very much, Guru Maharaj. Thank you very much for the class. Okay. Very nice. Okay, so have a nice Nishringa Chaturasi. Yeah? Yes. Thank you. Hare, Hare Krishna. Thank you. Hare Krishna. Have a good day. Thank you. Hare Krishna. Hare Thank Krishna. you so much. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Thank you very much. Jai, Oglar Shula Prabhupada. Jai. Jai.